Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, good to have you out there listening, and, and uh, I trust that you've had a good week. And so let's have a word of prayer, and we'll just get started. Our Father, we do love you. God, we thank you for your love to us. We, we thank you, God, for the rest that we had last evening and uh, the, the strength that you've given to us. And Lord, we thank you that we're uh, able to live in our country and where we are free. And Lord, we uh, pray for our leaders and that, Lord, you'd be an encouragement to all of them. And Lord, we, we want to thank you, God, that in, in our fellowship here, there's nobody that's sick. And, and Lord, so we just thank you for watching over us and protecting us. And Lord, we uh, thank you for, for the gals as they sing. And, and Lord, for all the effort they've put into all of the work that, we've, that they've been able to do. And the guys, too, as, as we've been together doing these services. And, and Lord, we just pray you'd can really pour out your blessing upon them. And Lord, we uh, pray for the church, that God, that all of us, that God, that you would just continue to be an encouragement to us. We pray for our men that are over in uh, other parts of the world, for Anthony and Josh. And Lord, we pray that you'd watch over them in the Persian Gulf and that you'd keep them safe and that you'd bring them all back home to us safe and sound without any problems, no injuries and mental anguish or anything like that. We just pray, God, you'd bring them all back home to us and we we'll sure praise you for it. We, uh, Lord, we, we pray for the ladies in our fellowship that are having babies and Lord, we, we pray that you'd just bless them and be an encouragement to them. We pray, God, that you'd bless them with strong, healthy babies and that they would grow up to honor and love their parents and that they would grow up to honor and love you and, and sure, we'll sure praise you for that. We, we pray, God, for our, our uh, thoughts about moving on down into the Trailside Center. We pray, God, that that, that would be greeted with uh, open arms out there and that, Lord, for those of us who feel comfortable in going down there, that we would be able to go and, and for others that want to stay home, we, we pray, God, that they too would just feel comfortable about doing that and we'll sure praise you for it. We thank you for the deacons and all the work they've done to get that going down there. And so, Lord, we're looking forward to the 31st and, and be able to start down there with one another. And we'll sure praise you for it. And God, we, we pray now that you'd bless the remainder of this service, that everything that's said and done would be honoring and pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. When upon life's pillows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Are you ever burdened with the load of the cross seem heavy you are called to bear count your many blessings every doubt will fly and you will be singing as the days go by count your blessings name them one by one count your blessings see what god hath done count your blessings name them one by one count your many blessings see what god hath Many blessings money cannot buy Your reward in heaven or your home on high Count your blessings, name them one by one Count your blessings, see what God hath done Count your blessings, name them one by one Count your many blessings, see what God hath done So amid the conflict, whether great or small. Do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see God had done. 
Christ will hold me fast when the tempter would prevail he will hold me fast I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path for my love is often cold he must hold he saves are his delight Christ will hold me fast precious in his holy sight he will hold me fast he'll not let my soul be lost his promises shall last but by him I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. I hope he's built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. But holy trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of Darkness 
seemed to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the Good morning again. Why don't you turn in your Bible with me, if you would, to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to get started at verses 1 and 2. But before we get started there, oh, by the way, I've entitled the message this morning, Word Pictures. We looked at Word Pictures a couple of weeks ago, and we're going to look at some more Word Pictures today. But before we get started in that, I was in my devotional book, and I found a devotional entitled, Importance of Christian Fellowship. The Importance of Christian Fellowship. And I really believe Christian Fellowship is something that's very important for all of us. It's important that we get together. And we can get together even in the midst of this pandemic. We can call each other on the telephone. If you have the right technology, you can Zoom one another and talk to one another. You can pray with each other and share your burdens with somebody and, and uh, they can help you out a little bit or maybe it's the other way around and they have a burden and you can help them out. But whatever it is, fellowship is very important thing to do. Th this devotion reads like this. If you're hurting, you will find this statement hard to believe. You are important to other Christians, to their faith and their growth in Christ likeness. And they are important to you. You gain strength and find encouragement when you spend time with your Christian brothers and sisters. Sharing your struggles with them will result in blessings of care, compassion, and prayer. You, in turn, can supply the same blessing when others are struggling. In his word, God cautions you to not to neglect the spending of time with, with fellow believers, even when, and maybe especially when, you're hurting. Whether you're on the giving or the receiving end, he wants to bless you through members of his family. In some related verses, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 to 25, it says this, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the days approaching. And then in 1 John chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, Whoever has his, this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in the truth. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And then in Ephesians chapter 2, 5, excuse me, verse 2 and 19 and verse 30, walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. For we are members of 
of his body, of his flesh, and of his bone. And then in John chapter 17, verse 11 and verses 21 down to verse 23. I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given to me, that they may be one as we are. They all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me and that the glory which you gave me I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved me as you have loved me. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, verse 46 to 47, speaking to new believers, he says, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayer, so continually, so continuing daily with with one accord in the temple and the breaking of bread from house to house, They ate the food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And then finally in Romans chapter 15, verses 5 to 7. May the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And amen. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started on the morning's message. Father, we do again want to tell you that we love you. We thank you, God, for your love to us. We thank you, God, for all those that are able to hear and listen. And Lord, we we pray that you'd anoint them with your spirit, that God, that you'd fill each one of us, that you'd give us a heart that's open and ready to receive all that you have for us today. I pray, Father, for myself, that Lord, that you'd anoint me with your spirit that you'd give me power to preach, that you'd help me to be calm as I work down through these notes, and that, Lord, you'd give me good recall of things that you and I have looked at. We pray, Father, that the lost might hear the gospel and be saved, that Christians would be encouraged, and that, Lord, that they would become stronger doers, greater disciples of yours, stronger in your word, and we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Anyway, this morning, so title for the message would be word pictures. That's what we're going to look at is word pictures. Last Sunday, it was Mother's Day, and we talked to mothers and talked about, to them about their responsibility towards their family and also the family's responsibility towards their mothers and husbands' responsibilities towards their wife. And I trust that this week you found yourself telling your mother how much you loved her and, and you husbands telling your wives how much you appreciate them and how much you love them. And I, I trust that it was just a, a great week as you, as you did those things together in obedience to the Lord's command. We're, we're going to start. At, oh, and also, we looked at the two words, revelation and inspiration, those are the two doctrinal words that we looked at. Oh, oh no, excuse me, that was a week after this. Last week we were in Mother's Day. To, a week before we started in a brand new doctrinal series, and there we were going to take a look at the word or, or doctrinal words that are in the Bible. And in that series, we started out with some word pictures, one word picture, that the word of God is light, that it enables us to be able to see. But not only does it enable us to be able to see, it also, light we saw dispelled darkness, that there's a lot of people like they were in that mammoth cave in darkness. The world out there that is lost in their sin is in darkness. They're spiritually blind to the things that are going on around about them. And the word of God helps to dispel that darkness that is there. The Holy Spirit of God comes and it's his position to shine the light on the word of God and to shine the light upon Jesus. So he draws people with what is called an efficacious grace, a grace that is irresistible and then he begins to open up the word of God to them and it convicts those people of the sin that's in their heart and they come to a place where they see that God is so pure and so holy and that they are just lost in their sin and it convicts them and then they think oh my what are we going to do and then the spirit of God shines the light upon Jesus and shows them that Jesus is their savior that he came to die for them that he substituted for them on a cross that he literally became their sin on that cross 
died on that cross, was buried and rose again, that they might be justified, that they might be right before God. And then those people, because the Spirit of God has done that, it opens up to them, and then they're able to exercise their faith and trust Jesus as their Savior. So the Word of God enables us to see, and it light there dispels the darkness, not only in an unbeliever's life, but in our life. We too sometimes grope around in the darkness and God uses his word to open up to us so we might be able to see. And we looked at two great doctrinal words last week, the word revelation and the word inspiration. And you recall that the word revelation is the activity of God in revealing truth to the mind of the Bible writer. And inspiration is the activity of God in giving us an infallible record of that revealed truth. So those two doctrinal words we looked at two weeks ago, and today we're going to continue on looking at some word pictures, and if the word of God is light that enabled us to see, today we're going to see that the word of God is food that enables us to grow. We're also going to see that the word of God is a tool that it helps us to build up ourselves and build up others that are around about us. And we're going to see that the word of God is a weapon. It causes us to be able to fight in the midst of the spiritual battle that we find ourselves in. And the doctrinal word that we're going to look at perhaps is the most doc most important doctrinal word in the Bible. The whole book of Romans was written around that one word, and that word is justification. But we're not going to spend a lot of time on it because I've talked to you so many times about it before and shared with you the definition of that, that word that you ought to be able to say to me and tell me exactly what justification is. But we'll spend a little bit of time on it looking at the definition of the word justification and looking at an illustration of the word justification. Next week, so you can have a preview of what's coming up, we're going to look at one doctrinal word, and that doctrinal word is the word adoption. Now, it's a word that's in the New Testament. You need to look it up. What is adoption? Adoption is, once again, the act of God by which he gives each of his children an adult standing in his family. Now, adoption is not salvation, not being born again. That's regeneration. We'll get to that word eventually. This is not being reborn. This is something that happens the moment you get reborn. God adopts you into his family. And when he gives you an adult standing in that family, not only does he give you an adult standing, but along with it, he gives you adult privileges and adult responsibilities. That's what we're going to look at next week. So you get in your Bible, look in your concordance, find the word adoption, and do some cross-referencing around and look at that word and see what you can come up with and then next week I'll show you what I come up with. All right, we'll all have a great time together. Anyway, today the word of God is food. It enables us to grow and we're going to start right there in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 1 and 2. It says there in verse 1, therefore putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that we so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. So he starts out by saying, put aside. So he's talking to brand new believers. He said, put aside all that malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy, all those things that used to be in our life. He said, put all that aside and be like newborn babies longing for the pure milk of the word of God that you can grow up and be strong. And it gives a picture there, doesn't it, of a baby of a mother and a baby. And we have all kinds of moms having babies in our church. And just next month, I think there's two, Taylor and uh, Vlad's wife, Lexi, is going to have a baby next month. Little babies. And we've had all kinds of little babies that have been born this year in our fellowship. And those little babies, when they are first born, they're all wrapped up nice and snug in those clothes. And when they get ready to eat, they let you know about it. And they want their mother's milk. And they want, or a bottle. And, and they just start crying and hollering if they don't get it. And that's, and so feed, give them the bottle. Let the mom nurse. And as soon as that happens, they, they quiet right down because they're so hungry. Their little bellies are growling because they want it. And it keeps on like that over and over and over again until pretty soon they get stronger and stronger and stronger, and pretty soon they're not just wrapped up in that little blanket. Pretty soon they're on the floor, and they're bouncing on their bellies. They're crawling on their knees. Little carpet creepers running all over the place. Oh, and then they, eventually they get a little bit bigger, and they hold on to your fingers, and you start to get them to make, take little steps, and they teeter, and pretty soon they're up there walking around on their own, tipping over, and then pretty soon they're running all around our feet all over the place. That's because they've gotten their mother's milk and they've gotten other nourishment and they've gotten stronger and stronger and stronger. The same thing is true of us when we take in the word of God. We're like, we should be like newborn babies crying for the word of God. Why? So that we can grow up. We shouldn't be just stuck back there eating milk toast. We ought to be up and getting the, the 
important parts of the word of God that causes us to be stronger and grow up. And another thing that I would say about this, you know, if a little baby is there and, and all of a sudden he stops eating, he just gets quiet and he just lays there. Everybody's in a panic. What's wrong? He must be sick. And we take him to the doctor. But what about Christians? that all of a sudden don't care anymore whether they have their devotions or go to the Bible or, or go to church, listen to pastor preach or go to Sunday school, and they just kind of neglect something's wrong. There's something wrong with us when that happens. You see, the word of God should be like that and mother's milk to us, that we want it so much that we long for it that we can grow up and be strong. And when we don't get it, we're going to get anemic and weak and we need help when that happens. In Matthew chapter 4, in verse 4, it says this, Jesus said this, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, he's not saying that we shouldn't eat bread or that we shouldn't eat food. We should definitely eat that. But he's saying man simply cannot live on that. If you're going to be a spiritual person, if you're going to be one of his children, you need to eat every word of God that proceeds out of the mouth of God in order for us to grow up. The food enables us to grow. The word of God enables us to grow up spiritually. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, it says, But grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You see, the word of God causes us to do that. It causes us to grow in grace. And, and where do we get that grace from? God is grace. What is grace? Grace is when we receive something we don't deserve. That's grace. And so as we're growing up in the Lord and we're getting stronger and stronger in his word, pretty soon we're doing the same thing. We're giving to those that don't deserve it. That's grace. So we're growing up in grace. We grow up in compassion and love and forgiveness and long-suffering towards people. All of those things, as we're growing up, we're becoming more and more like Christ. And so he says, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We should be growing as we get to know God better. The more we're in the word, the more we get to know him. Not, not just his attributes that are multiple, but also hit the way in which he does things, his compassion and love and kindness and all those things. We're to grow up and to know him, to know him personally, to have a walking, talking relationship with God Almighty. In, in uh, A.W. Tozer's book, The Knowledge of the Holy, in the preface of his book, he's got an outstanding couple of paragraphs. Let me read them to you. The first paragraph reads like this, the low view of God, that is not knowing God very well, the low view of God entertained almost universally among Christians is the cause of a hundred lesser evils everywhere among us. I would say amen to that. The idea of not knowing God well is a cause of a hundred lesser evils among us. Let me read it again. The low view of God entertained almost universally among Christians is the cause of a hundred lesser evils everywhere among us. A whole new philosophy of Christian life has resulted from this one basic error in our religious thinking. With our loss of the sense of majesty has come the further loss of religious awe and consciousness of the divine presence. We have lost our spirit of worship and our ability to draw inwardly to meet God in adoring silence. Modern Christianity is simply not producing the kind of Christian who can appreciate or experience the life in the spirit. The words be still and know that I am God mean next to nothing to the self-confident bustling worshiper in this first period of the 21st century. We are of a lack of the knowledge of God. But here that verse says, grow up in the word. If you got the word of God, you can grow up in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16, the weeping prophet, he says this, your words were food and I ate them. Isn't that something? Now he's not saying that he picked up a scroll and ate that thing. He wasn't eating the Bible. But he's saying it was so much to him that he ate that thing. He just ate it up in his soul. Your words were found and I did eat them. And your words became for me a joy and a delight of my heart. You see, that's what the Bible ought to be. It ought to be something that we just eat up, that we just can't get enough, but we want it like that newborn baby. And we eat it, and it becomes a joy to our hearts to be able to take in the word of God. He goes on and says, For I have been called by your name, O Lord of hosts. You and I, we've been called by the Lord's name. The Lord of hosts has called us, and his word ought to be that kind of importance to us, that it's a joy to us, and we want to just eat that thing up. In Job, chapter 23, verse 12, Job, now Job had all kinds of problems. I mean, he had such a bad problem. His family had died, his, his money, all of his things were taken away from him. His wife even told him to curse God and die. And listen to what old Job said in Job, chapter 23, and verse 12. 
He says, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. With all that going on, I have not departed from the commandments of the lips of God. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than the necessary food for me. Now, he, he was sick, and he needed food. But he said, I wanted the word of God more than the necessary food for my life. That ought to be us. Why did, why did Job want that? Because he knew it caused him to grow up and be strong. In the book of Hebrews, you want to turn your Bible there, Hebrews, to the book of Hebrews chapter 5, and I want to look at verse 11 down to the end of the chapter to verse 14. And it says there, concerning him, we have so much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Paul's saying that to these Hebrew Christians. He said, you've become dull of hearing. You're not listening right. For, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God or the word of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk and not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. He says, to these Christians. He said, you, you shouldn't be eating milk. You've been around long enough now. You should be teachers. You should know the word of God and you should be strong in the word of God. Think of that. What a picture that is. The, the, here they are. The, the word of God is there and, and they should have been growing and they're not growing. Just think and say they're a, just say they're a 12 year old Christian. We'll just hypothetical that out there. A person has been 12 years old in Christ. He's been in the Bible, he's heard sermons preached, he's gone to Sunday school, and he says, these people now, 12 years old, and they're eating milk rather than solid food. That's strange, isn't it? I mean, what if we turn that around? What if we said, here's this little baby that was nursing on his mother, and it was normal because he was little, but now he's 12 years old, and he gets hungry, he comes up and nudges mom and says, come on, mom. That's weird, isn't it? That would be weird. We wouldn't want, we'd think that's a strange thing to do. But that's exactly the way we ought to feel about Christians who have been in the Bible, who have been saved for 12 years, who are falling back into eating milk instead of the solid food of the Word of God. And part of that, I think, is our fault, pastor's fault. I'll pick on us because lots of pastors put out nothing but milk. They don't put out the meat of the Word of God. And so what we've got is a bunch of anemic Christians that have a hard time knowing who God is and, and, and been around for a long time, and they're falling over with weakness because they haven't taken in the Word of God. I tell you, as long as I'm going to be the pastor here, I will always give you the meat of the Word of God. And as long as Tim Blanchard is filling in for me, he will give you the meat of the Word of God. There will be no milk toast Christians, no milk toast pastors stand in this pulpit as long as I'm here. And so we need to be in the Word because the Word of God causes us to grow up. God's Word is also a tool. It enables us to build, to build up. Jeremiah, again, the weeping prophet, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29. He says, is not my word like a fire, God declares God? That's, God says that. Is not my word like a fire, declares the Lord? What does a fire do? A fire melts down the gold or the silver. And when it's melted down, then the dross comes to the surface. And that looks like mud up there. And you just take that off so you can have pure gold. He says, isn't my word like that? It's like a fire that purifies and makes you stronger and makes you more pure before me, declares the Lord. And like a hammer, now there's a tool, which shatters the rock to pieces. You and I are growing up in Christ. And he says his word is like that hammer. You know, we, we, when we get saved, we carry along a whole bunch of old stuff along with us. And the word of God chips away at those things and causes us constantly to be being conformed into the image of God's son. As he takes away that stuff that is holding us down as we get the word of God and we see it, man. And then we just change our direction and we do something else. We respond to an invitation and we do what we're supposed to do. And that stuff goes flying off. It's like a hammer that breaks and shatters the rock. In Acts chapter 20, in verse 32, it says, Now I command you, commend you, excuse me, now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are, who are sanctified. So he says the word of God builds you up, gives you grace, gives you grace. And we already talked about that, how grace is something given out when we, what we don't deserve, and we give that out. So the word of God gives us that. It gives us that grace. The, a new com, com, 
Now I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. So as we're in the word of God, we receive this inheritance. And now he's not just talking about someday standing at the Bema seat, at the judgment seat of Christ, where we're going to receive rewards. It's not that. But the more we know these doctrinal words, the more we are going to see the inheritance that we have. And it's such a marvelous thing that we can have all of that inheritance and with all the other saints that are around about us. So the word of God is a tool that builds us up. The word of God is light. It enables us to see. The word of God is food. It enables us to grow. The word of God is a tool that enables us to build ourselves up and to build others up. And finally, the word of God is a weapon that enables us to fight. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, and in verse 12, it says this, For the word of God is living and active, and there it is, sharper than any two-edged sword. Now that is a weapon. Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the vision of the soul and the spirit, both the joint and the marrow, and is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of our heart. So the word of God is, is that kind of a weapon. It gets right in, digs right into us and shows us what we're thinking about. And, and right down to our very marrow of our bones, it, it shows that, shows the intention of our heart. The word of God lays that out for us. We're in the midst of a great spiritual battle. Not only is the sword mentioned there, but in Hebrews chapter, not Hebrews, but in Ephesians, if you want to turn to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, and we want to start up at verse 10, and we're going to look down at a few verses and talk about the armor of God. It says finally in verse 10, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God. Why? So that you will be able to stand firm against all the schemes of the devil. For our struggle, our battle, is not against flesh and blood. It's not against Republicans or Democrats. It's not against uh, senators or congressmen. It's not against the Russians or the Chinese. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces and the wicked, of wickedness in the heavenly places. So our battle is against spiritual forces, against the devil and his crowd. Therefore, he says, in light of that, therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done all to resist, stand firm. So he tells us to put on the armor of God. Now I'm going to change the order a little bit. I'm going to work from the top and work my way down. First, he says that we should put on the helmet of our salvation. What is that? That's the knowledge to know that we are saved. It's amazing to me that people can walk around and not know, say they're Christians and not realize that they are saved or can be saved today and lost tomorrow. How can you go into a battle with the idea that, you, that somehow you can lose it? When God clearly says to you that you stand in the hands of an omnipotent God, that nothing can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, that he sealed you with his spirit. We need to have that in our head. We need to know, we need to have on the helmet of salvation so we can charge ahead into the battle that God has given to us knowing that the victory is ours because the victory is in Christ. So he said, put on the helmet of salvation. And by the way, when, when Paul's talking about this to the Ephesians, it's kind of a picture of a Roman soldier. And a Roman soldiers always had on the helmet that was there. And then they had a breastplate, a, a breastplate they put on. We're going to call it the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness. Well, that was they put on this big shiny breastplate, had these big pecs and a big eight pack down on their belly. Now, a little skinny Italian guy, if you took it off, he might be that big around. I don't know. But that was really intimidating. If you put it, they, that Roman soldiers would line up on top of the ridges and the battle was going to be waged below and the sun would shine on those breastplates and it intimidated the enemy. That was the whole idea. He tells us that we are to put on the breastplate of righteousness. What is that? That's our testimony. We're to let our light so shine before a world that's around about us that they would see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. It's part of our weapons. It's part of what we put on in this str struggle that we're having. And then he says we're to gird our loins with the truth. What is the truth? The truth is the word of God, Jesus said. And so every single day of our life, we ought to be having our devotions. We ought to go to church. We ought to do the things on Sunday when we get around to get able to do that or listen to somebody else preach or go to Sunday school. We ought to be girding up our loins on a regular basis. That's for our own good. Right? And then he says, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Roman soldiers. They had their feet shod so they wouldn't twist and bust their ankles, that their feet would be protected. And so we're to put on the gospel shoes and get going. That's right. 
put, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Jesus said, go ye therefore into all the world, preach the gospel to all creatures. So that's what we're to do. We're to get going. That's the idea of the gospel shoes. If we're going to evangelize people, we can't sit still. We can't even sit still in this pandemic. We can't sit still. There's still people that you can talk to and that you can share and that you can get these sermons out to people and say, listen to this, or share the gospel with them. We're to get going. So have your feet shod at the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then he says we're to pull out the sword. And he says clearly in the Bible, it's a sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We say we already got our loins girded to the truth. This sword is to do battle. When the Roman soldiers pulled it out, they did slashing and killing and fighting with that. You and I pull out the word of God to do battle. So when Satan rears his ugly head, we've got a weapon. That's what Jesus did, isn't it? And we're supposed to be imitators of him. We're to follow him on the mountain of temptation. That's what Jesus did. Every time Satan reared his head and tempted Jesus, he pulled the word of God on him and quoted the Bible. We should do the same thing. We need to be armed with the word of God. I fear for us sometimes that, that we, we're, we're so not used to that that our sword is stuck in its sheath, rusted in there, and we need to pull that baby out of there and go to work with that thing. We need to know the Bible, not only so we can grow up, but it's a weapon for us that we can use in the spiritual struggle that we're having. And then finally, he says, pick up the shield of faith. What is that? That's trusting God. You know, the Bible says it's impossible to please God apart from faith. And so we need to trust him when we go into these battles. We need to put our faith and trust in the Lord. All of that we get from the word of God. The word of God is a weapon. It enables us to be able to fight. And finally, I want to just look at that one doctrinal word very quickly. Like I said, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, the word justification. Now, if I'd ask you, I'd hope that you could tell me what justification is. But let me give it to you. Justification is the righteous act of a holy God, right? Right? It's a righteous act of a holy God whereby he declares the sinner righteous who believes in Jesus Christ. Now that's justification. Let me give that to you again. Justification is the righteous act of a holy God whereby he declares, he declares the sinner righteous who believes in Jesus Christ. It, another way of saying that is it just like you never sinned. Like it never happened. Like God just declares you righteous. He's wiped the slate clean. He's cast your sin as far as he says from the west. He shoved it behind his back. He's never going to bring it up. He remembers your sin no more. All of that. It's like it's gone. And in Warren Wiersbe's book, and I've read this illustration to you before, but I'll read it to you again. I think it's the best one I've ever heard too. Wiersbe says this, My friend Dr. Roy Gustafson has the finest illustration of justification I have ever heard. It seems that there was a man in England who put his Rolls Royce on a boat and went across the continent to go on a holiday. While he was driving around Europe, something happened to the motor of his car. He cabled the Rolls Royce people back in England and asked, I am having trouble with my car. What do you suggest I do? Well, the Rolls Royce people flew a mechanic over. The mechanic repaired the car and flew back to England and left the man to continue his holiday. As you can imagine, the fellow was wondering, how much is this going to cost me? So when he got back to England, he wrote the people a letter and asked how much he owed them. He received a letter from the office that that reads like this, quote, Dear Sir, there is no record anywhere in our files that anything ever went wrong with a Rolls Royce. End of quote. And Wearsby says, now that's justification. That's exactly what justification is. There's no record. God has no record of your sin. Jesus paid the price for your sin. He paid the penalty for your sin, and it is gone. It is wiped out, and there's no record before a God that is holy because he, that holy God, has declared you righteous, the sinner who believes in Jesus Christ. What are you going to do with this kind of a message? What are you going to do with the word of God? Is it light for you? Are you able to see because the word of God is there? Is the word of God food is enabling you to grow? Are you growing up because you're in the world? Are you stuck back there reeking up the milk that was there when you should be strong and being more and more in the word of God and being able to be teachers by this time? What are you going to do? Is the word a tool for you that enables you to build yourself up and to build others up around you? Is the word of God a weapon? Are you using it as a weapon that enables you to fight not against people but against the spiritual forces around? What are you going to do with that? And maybe you're out there and you're blind and you're, it's darkness and the word of God is enabling you to see and God has really been drawing you and pulled you to listen to a message like this and to know that Jesus died for you and is buried for you and rose again. What are you going to do with that light that he's given to you? Will you receive Jesus by faith in your heart? If you do that right now, just without even praying, if you just believe what the Lord has done for you, he'll give you eternal life 
and he will, he will justify you and declare you righteous and adopt you into his family and give you an adult standing in that family with adult responsibilities and adult privileges. What are you going to do with what the Lord has given to you? Let's pray and we'll be finished. Father, we do love you. We thank you again, God, for loving us. I, I pray as the ladies come that people are out there that are listening to this, that, Lord, they would make decisions, that they would see what you've done in your word, and that maybe they're lacking in an area, and that, God, that you would help them to make a decision to live re more right before you. Maybe they're infants, and they've been Christians for a long time. Maybe they can make a commitment to be in your word and to study your word and to grow up in Christ. Or maybe, Lord, there's people out there that are lost and need Jesus, I pray, God, as the ladies sing, that people would do business with you and that those that are lost would receive Jesus as their Savior. And I'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home. Mercies, mercy. 